Hi. Hello. If we really want to tackle a climate urgency, we need to we need to promote more solutions that focus on methane and mitigation, and we need to focus on the food systems and even also on the waste sector. Uh, there's a lot of focus already on gas and oil, not enough, but there's still a lot of uh, focus on it, and we still need, and we need to really start getting food systems to start mitigating methane. And to that extent, we have such an amazing panel, each one that can bring in solutions from all the different hotspots that come in within the food system. Uh, unfortunately, we were supposed to also, following this panel, have a fire chat with Rick Duke. Uh, and he has to go to a meeting that and had to cancel last minute. But I actually think this might be for the best because I did not think that 30 minutes was going to be enough for this amazing panel. And now we have a longer time to have a more in-depth conversation and really shine light on the solutions out there. So it's my absolute pl pl pleasure to call in a Rachel Barr, our moderator, uh, and a colleague and a partner of mine. And we look forward to enjoying this session, and, and hopefully we can also get questions from the audience, and we have now time for it. Okay, so enjoy. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rachel Barr, and I just want to give a round of applause for Lee and Olive Farms for putting this event together. It takes a lot of work, and I see what Lee does every day, and I just want to acknowledge her here because she's such a leader in this field. Thank you. We're gonna be here for a little while, and it's a little toasty, so if you're not comfortable, I wanna encourage you all to take a moment, take off your jackets, take a breath, take a swig of water. I might do the same at some point, so just <laughs> FYI. Um, but we're here to talk about a very important topic. We need to transition away from the conventional, and this includes us thinking about ag very differently, and this panel's designed for us to talk about the sustainable future with a reduced methane footprint, and so I'm excited to have this conversation. Thank you to all four of you for coming. And in advance, if I butcher any of your names, including Christopher, <laughs> I apologize in advance. No, no, no. <laughs> My mother liked that name. <laughs> um, Mumukushu. Almost. Almost. <laughs> Please correct me. <laughs> I'm hyper dyslexic. <laughs> Mumukushu. Yeah. Um, Climate Advisors came out recently with a report on methane alternatives in the protein space. Can you please break down those numbers for us? And I don't want to overwhelm you with this additional part of the question, but if, if you want me to repeat, I will at the end. How can alt, alt proteins support the methane reduction within the food systems? Sure. So thanks for the question, Rachel. And uh, I'm from Climate Advisors, which is one of the oldest climate policy organizations. And is this better? Uh, it's a big face, I think. <laughs> I mean, the room is small enough. Better now? Yeah, All right. Perfect. So thanks again, Rachel. And I'm from Climate Advisors, which is um, one of the oldest climate policy organizations. And um, I lead the food and agriculture practice where we focus on how to reduce food systems related greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and one of our big pillars of work is uh, supporting advocacy for sustainable and alternative proteins. So we see alternative proteins as the single biggest solution to uh, methane emissions from food systems. So I wanted to lay that out straight open. But before delving into details, just a few macro numbers. Uh, methane is the second most potent gas, so it's really important to address uh, emissions of methane. Uh, 80 times more powerful than carbon dioxide, and over 90% of anthropogenic methane emissions come from three sources, agriculture, fossil fuels, and waste. And since food and agriculture and waste are all related, combining food, agriculture, and waste is more than fossil fuels. So if you want to make a big dent in methane emissions, you can't get rid of it without addressing food systems related emissions. Now, um, we also think that foods, um, about half of the methane from food systems emissions comes from a process which is called enteric fermentation, uh, quite a mouthful like my first name. It's a natural process that occurs <laughs> as ruminant animals such as cows and sheep digest food. So basically think burping cows. What's more, emissions from this source is on track to roughly increase by 50% by 2050 as more and more people globally are well off and have preferences to eat meat, particularly ruminant meat. So of course, this trend is incompatible with internationally agreed climate goals. 
And so, um, as, as this panel is supposed to say, what is the solution suite? So, if a sufficiently ambitious near-term methane emissions um, uh, could achieve at least a half a degree Celsius worth of um, uh, temperature reduction, and that is why we had 150 countries sign the methane pledge uh, to reduce methane emissions by 30% by 2030. But how do you get there? I mean, strategies to reduce direct emissions from ruminant animal production by manipulating animals' diets and providing them better health care, as well as providing innovation to reduce enteric fermentation, will obviously result in mitigation, but it will be nowhere near the mitigation that we need to reduce uh, or to hold the Paris target of 1.5. Um, because of the increasing demand for meat, that is just not possible to achieve. So we and many other researchers who have studied the issue closely have concluded that a suite of interventions that both reduce emissions from animal protein and foster innovation in alternative proteins is critical to reduce methane emissions from food systems. We want to enable greater consumer choice to enable a more sustainable food system. APs could reduce methane emissions by as much as 1.8 tons, gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent by 2050, roughly halving food systems methane emissions. Now, a, a recent report from UNEP echoes our findings and also points out the health benefits of alternative proteins, uh, such as countering antimicrobial resistance. But all this would require significant public R&D for both um, you know, at the discovery end, but also at development and commercialization. Now, what we are advocating for is levels up to $10 billion a year uh, by 2030. Right now, it's a couple of million dollars a year. Now, if you compare what the EVs, um, electronic vehicles, got in the transport sector, that was by an order of magnitude uh, greater than what we are advocating here for emissions that are going to far outpace um, in terms of their methane reduction potential, to just putting that in context. And lastly, interestingly and perhaps um, most importantly for overall greenhouse gas emissions from food systems, alternative proteins also ad help address the overlooked issue of nitrous oxide, the forgotten greenhouse gas, where food systems is again the primary driver of N2O emissions. By helping reduce the demand for animal feed crops and fertilizer use associated with that process, we can make significant dents in nitrous oxide emissions that are more than 300 times powerful than carbon dioxide and last significantly longer in the atmosphere than methane. And we are looking into this issue closely, but just wanted to flag that alternative proteins, you can kill two birds, so to speak, with one stone, uh, both nitrous oxide and methane. So thank you. I forgot to introduce you formally, and I apologize. Mamukshu is the Senior Director of Food and Agriculture at, the, at Climate Advisors, uh, an expert indeed. And I think one of the points that you made that merits us considering deeper is the disproportionate underinvestment in this area and the need for us to do more, not just, in my opinion, in catalyst funding, but helping to scale up good ideas. We'll take our next question. Lisa Moon, you are the President of the Global Food Banking Network and we've known each other for a number of years now. Um, how can food banks actively contribute to the methane mitigation effort, especially within the food chain and cold storage and end of life? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thank you so much for putting together such an interesting panel, and I know I'm already going to learn a lot. <laughs> so, um, so the Global Food Banking Network, just to give you a little sense of us, we are actually more from the humanitarian food security space. Um, and uh, food banking is a community-based model to uh, uh, identify surplus food in local food systems and then more or less save it and redistribute it to people facing hunger. Um, and uh, we are very fortunate to connect these types of organizations in 50 countries. Um, annually, they are increasing food access for approximately 32 million people facing hunger. But of course, there's a flip side to this, since the vast majority of the food that food banks are distributing is surplus product that would have been destined for landfill or to be discarded. And so over the past couple of years, we have been really trying to quantify and understand more about what the environmental impact of a community-based food bank can be. And if you roll that up globally, what can that be in terms of supporting uh, not just national, um, national plans for uh, reducing uh, CO2? 
and mitigating climate change, uh, but also globally, how can they be part of the global conversation? Um, so we've done some initial calculations on that. Uh, last year, for example, we estimate that the food recovered by the organizations that we work with amounted to about 1.5 million metric tons of CO2e. Um, and then we are very fortunate to have a new partnership with the Global Methane Hub. And through them, we are working to develop a methodology um, that identifies specifically the methane emissions that are avoided through food banking activities. Um, I would say about 75% of the food banking organizations in our network actively consider environmental causes to be a core part of their mission. Um, but of course, they're doing that alongside the other significant crisis that is interacting with the climate crisis, and that's the humanitarian um, situation that our world is facing, where you have 800 million people that daily struggle to access enough food to survive, 2.3 billion people that are facing food insecurity, and over 3 billion people that cannot afford a nutritious diet. And so I think there's a real opportunity opportunity here as we have to with all of these meta challenges that um, are converging as we approach 2050 to be thinking about how do we make sure as we're making plans to um, uh, to mitigate <laughs> methane um, you know reach the the targets in the Paris agreement how do we make sure there are co-benefits in place to address many of the other humanitarian planetary nature challenges that we're facing Lisa, I have a follow-up question for you. We see here at COP the very big gap sometimes between what we know to be action on the ground that's actually mitigating methane and, and programmatics that might not be capturing that as such in terms of the reporting. And I'm curious, can you speak of any case studies that you know of where they are accounting for the methane within the food banking ecosystem? Yeah, so we have a, a couple of pilots going on specifically on this right now simply because there is such an interest, I think, from as a result of the methane pledge and from companies to be thinking about how saving food can be avoiding methane emissions. Um, and I think uh, and not just looking at it from the, the, the food waste side, but also from the food loss side, because much of what is recovered by food banks is in partnership with farmers and packers and food manufacturers, um, which is also causing harmful emissions. I've heard some interesting things about farm to fork mm. uh, and, and the Internet of Things, how it's playing into the, the tracking of methane, and I'm curious to see if and how with time those types of softwares will be will be implemented into your, your ecosystems. Yeah, we would be very much so interested in that. I think it would be helpful for all of our recovery efforts. Chris, you are the public affairs and regenerative agriculture um, person at Danone. <laughs> Something like that. Human, let's say. Yeah. You're a human first, and the other thing second. Yeah, um, uh, drawing from your experience, um, given that Danone's footprint globally is is in all of our refrigerators and all of our households. How do feed additives and, and, and animal welfare actively contribute to the principles of regen agricultures? And what potential do they hold in reducing methane yeah. emissions in the realm of animal farming? Yeah, that question gets right to the, the big uh, piece that you pointed out on enteric fermentation. Let me take a quick step back and then get to that. So this has been a journey for us. We've been deeply involved in working upstream with our farmers across the globe for the past five, six, seven years, depending on how you count. And you know, dairy farming, like all farming, is very different, right? Not one dairy farm is like another dairy farm. Even in the United States, where we have very sophisticated dairies, you can find a range of different challenges, you know, from big dairies to medium dairies, arid climate, wet climates, they have a lot of variety of different challenges. So you have to think of dairy as a spectrum of options, like all ag systems, right? There's cropland intersections with manure, there's manure infrastructure issues, and then there's the massive enteric uh, challenge. Actually, the, the one bucket that I didn't speak, uh, I should be more clear about, is herd management at large, which gets to the enteric issue a little bit. It's really about efficiency, and that's your genomics, that's your feed uh, nutrition to the cow. Animal welfare is a huge component. A less stressed animal is gonna produce more milk, frankly. Uh, and then to the enteric, which is really the innovation side. We really don't have a lot of options at the moment in commercial use on enteric outside of just good herd management first and foremost. So one of the things we've done over the last couple of years, first and foremost, we took a huge step last year in going just from a soil strategy to a methane strategy. We put out a 30% commitment, uh, we're aiming for a 30% reduction by 2030 on our fresh milk supply. That is going to be a stretch. That is going to be difficult. We thought it was very important to put that out there because as a science-based target company where we're aiming for 30% across our entire ag or flag, the, the land use sector, 
methane's 25% of that scope. We've got to go after methane. And you know, primarily, it's going to be enteric, but manure also is going to be a key, key piece. So as we move forward this year into this COP, we had two massive announcements coming in. One was um, contributing financially to the Global Methane Hub Enteric Accelerator, because right now there is a massive issue across all, it's a global issue. We need coordinated research for these really attractive innovations that we think can get to market, but the research isn't there yet. We need publicly available research. Danone can't be the arbiter of that research. We need to be sure that it's safe for a cow, that it's safe for human consumption, and that the environmental efficacy is spot on or as good as we can get. So that's what the Enteric Accelerator, and we, we're going to be, it's, we're very excited. We're the only company in it now. Hopefully more companies will join, but really interesting uh, gap filler, hopefully, on the research side. And then also, we just allow announced a uh, Dairy Methane Action Alliance, DEMA, with Environmental Defense Fund, and that's with five other big dairy companies, uh, Lactalis USA, uh, General Mills, uh, Nestle, I'm forgetting one, I'm sorry, that's out there in the public sphere, but, um, but we're excited to really bring what we've been doing um, with Environmental Defense Fund and just bring this collaboration, a pre-competitive collaboration, where we can discuss these different options, and whether it's a small holder in North Africa, whether it's a big farm in the US, really start to be, what are the best practices, what makes the most sense for every dollar that we have available to spend. And then, sorry, roundabout answer to the enteric. Um, we have one available commercial innovation. It's called Bovaire. It's from a company called DSM. It just was approved in this past year in Europe and parts of Latin America. We are paying that cost for farms using it in places like Belgium and Spain, uh, Brazil. It's expensive. And, the supply, and hopefully the price will come down, like all innovations do, hopefully over time. But this gets back to the Enteric Accelerator. We need more options. We have a seaweed company called Symbrosia. I shouldn't say we. It's a, we're an investor in a seaweed company called Symbrosia. Very exciting out of the state of Hawaii in the United States, where red asparagopsis seaweed potentially can disrupt that, that fermentation or ferme enteric fermentation process, potentially reducing methane emissions 80 to 90%. We are going to accelerate trials at Cornell University in the United States next year with Symbrosia to really get that public data down so that we can accelerate it into commercial use, hopefully. So these are just some of the components we're looking at. There's probiotic potentials on enteric. Um, you know, if you talk to Hayden Montgomery at Global Methane Hub, he would love to shoot for a vaccine someday so that we could get easier distribution to smallholders. These enteric, and this is a daily management issue. It's about putting it, you know, Dia Bovaire, you got to put it in the feed every single day. You stop putting it in the feed, the impact uh, goes away. So we need to find things that A, are cost effective, practical, and then that also can just, from a farm standpoint, they can do um, smallholders to large farms. I, I will note, Chris, that, that Danone was the first to, to release a pledge on methane reduction in their milk. So while I commend the, the alliance in general, I would just want to highlight your, your company's you. leadership there. Thank you. Thelok. Yes. You are the president of LOAM. Yeah. And the executive director of FIN Sri Lanka. Um, the focus of your organizations are on rice. Often overlooked in this space until this year and in, in, in recent years, but I think increasingly we're understanding the relevance of rice cultivation, especially in certain parts of the world where it's a dominant part of the methane accounting. Can you please discuss the best practices and tr technologies that are available for mitigating methane emissions in rice cultivation, especially considering that there are traditional and innovative solutions? Thank you, Rachel. Uh, you um, pleasure to be here uh, with this great panel. Uh, I think it is, uh, if you look at it across Asia, we are the most rice-eating nations. Uh, same time, we were target uh, not only Asia, also in Africa, and uh, the, some part of Latin America, uh, even Europe, like Italy, uh, the, you are growing a lot of rice. Uh, bit, uh, uh, the the last uh, few decades, we were questioning how this rice cultivation affecting to the climate change, and we always think uh, the small uh, operation can't be uh, that much uh, cost. But uh, you know, the, when you collect all these small small things, it is a cause of the big problem. And the when uh, this is. Uh, happening, the, some of us had uh, the different uh, approaches to mitigate, uh, the, especially in the methane uh, emissions. Uh, you know, the, uh, the old days in across Asia, 
the we had uh, some practices you know the rice plant was not grown in the in the irrigated fields it was actually it was in the forest and then brought into the the upland and then we wet, uh, bring, brought into the uh, kind of uh, wet uh, situations and that is because of the yield the the when you are growing uh, comparing with the upland and the uh, especially in the wet uh, situation you can get more yield in the wet situation but uh, in a in a uh, in a system like uh, the traditional uh, the the rice varieties what we have grown in our chena cultivation and and nowadays we call it upland rice cultivation and we had uh, some adaptive uh, situations where the traditional seed could uh, uh, perform well but uh, after bringing it to the wet situation those were not uh, uh, the responding to the dry condition and with the climate change uh, we have to face now this uh, situation therefore we have to go back a step and with the researchers of the uh, the several institutions and we have done it uh, the we found some of the traditional rice varieties can be adaptive to uh, this situation because if you are not irrigating it the there won't be a more methane because uh, in the dry condition you are not getting methane in there mm. and 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 top of that we have introduced new system called SRI, SRI, and and you are covering with even though you are doing the small irrigation, you can cover it and you are not exposing it to the sun, and then also the methane will uh, not emit that much of uh, the system, and this system also uh, the we improved with the. Uh, as he was talking about livestock, because in Asia, you see, the it is an integrated farm. You have a little bit of uh, chickens, uh, ki uh, chicks, and also the uh, the pigs or, or the the cows. Many uh, livestock is in the farmhouse, and and with that uh, they get a lot of uh, uh, cow dung or the uh, the uh, uh, excreta and we put it to the uh, the the paddy land and it is also when you irrigated it can be generate more methane in a, the new system what we it is not a new system but the biogas system what we have get uh, uh, into and it has uh, the several impact because in a in a way you are not uh, putting into the uh, open uh, uh, system and that methane uh, goes through the, uh, the, 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 the all the the vegetable uh, the or the farm uh, the farm yard manure can go through this uh, the biogas digester and it can reduce uh, the methane emission and it uh, come with the very good uh, fertilizer as uh, compost and bio slurry also we can use it to the uh, the field as uh, the the solution and and nowadays most of the uh, the cities have a lot of uh, problem with the garbage and even the vegetable waste fruit waste we can bring it to these uh, uh, this uh, the the biogas digesters it is uh, the for the small farmer it is little bit cost it take it need uh, two three thousand dollars <coughs> with their labor they can bring it to down for a thousand two thousand five hundred with the material cost and they can easily uh, set up uh, this kind of a system uh, and we we have uh, practiced with the many of the uh, the farmers if you uh, integrate with uh, the SRI system with the biogas, the you are um, ninety percent you can reduce the methane emission. And with this uh, uh, system, and we also uh, should look at how much water can save, because in the irrigation you need, uh, the, you know, the the our farmers used to. Uh, uh, do 
improve the flooding in the irrigation in the, their paddy fields. But if you are uh, the really uh, go with the, uh, the, the, uh, the SRI system, even you can uh, reduce a lot of weed Inst because the water is used for the flooding for control the weed. If you are using the rice straw or any other straw uh, to cover it up in the soil, and you can also reduce uh, chemical usage, agrochemical usage, and all other uh, unnecessary uh, the usage. And it is also saving farmers income. And, and these uh, practices, we need some external input. Uh, and also the extension system in our countries are not that much uh, uh, perfect. And therefore, the digi uh, digitization could be a solution uh, the farmers to get to understand this uh, system where they can. This is not a, uh, the kind of a rocket science. It is a, uh, uh, the small technology where we can, farmers can adapt easily. Hey, look, I like how you highlight that this isn't rocket science, but what it is is complex. You've highlighted here that even in talking about agriculture, we're still talking about waste and we're still talking about fertilizers, which again goes to oil and gas production potentially and things like that. So we're talking across the major industries of the methane ecosystem in terms of footprint. And I, I appreciate you highlighting that because here at COP, even within the methane community, which I think is rather small, we often are still siloed, and so I appreciate you bringing in waste to the conversation as a waste lady myself yeah. from my origins. Um, I think we're going to pivot back to Mamukshu. And when we talk about solutions, we often hear about young solutions. Uh, early, early stage series, A, maybe, maybe, you know, many are pre-seed seed. And so my question to you, given that you have a more macro overview of this, of this ecosystem, uh, have you seen examples of rat rapid transition at scale uh, of innovations, such as a AP, but in other sectors mm -hmm. that can mainly address methane? Sure. Um, now I'll get to that. And I just wanted to add to the rice bed because um, previously in my, I used to be a program officer at the Gates Foundation and used to fund rice projects. And um, one of the things that people don't quite realize is that when you export rice from water deficient countries like India, you're essentially exporting water. Yeah. And um, that's a huge risk for these countries. So as people get a comprehensive view, it's one of the fundamentals that people forget. Uh, and getting back to the question uh, is, um, yes, uh, you know, these technologies are pretty early stage. Um, people like Aleph Farms are taking huge risks here. Um, but it's also important because it is largely the smaller, potentially food insecure or very fragile food environment countries that are taking the lead here. Um, you know, it's not only Israel, but Singapore is one of the leaders. And then you have certain countries in Asia, like South Korea, who are also doing some interesting stuff here. So you have a leading group of countries that are trying to diversify their protein uh, base. But again, getting back to the point is that um, getting public investment is going to be critical for any new technology, right? And um, again, getting back to the EV example, I mean, um, Elon Musk would not be the richest man in the world were it not for the US government, right? Tesla got a huge subsidy, you know. Uh, so it was a big handout, but it, you know, it was a handout that was given for a technology that was needed to address a global problem. So that is how classic public goods should be funded in economic theory. And um, at this COP, we are seeing a lot of solutions. And uh, the cross-cutting theme at this COP for solutions is finance. And you know, that finance comes from the World Bank or somewhere else, uh, but, but you do need it. And so again, getting back to the EV example, it's not only what you get in terms of funding, uh, but it's also in terms of an enabling policy environment. So if you go to LAX airport right now, if you want to park your Tesla, it's $20 per hour, and if you want to do a regular car, it's $25 per hour. So you, those are the kinds of minor, very minor regulatory things that also need to happen to get that adoption at scale pretty quickly. Um, in India, for instance, right now, um, you have people who are not drinking dairy milk. 
Now, cow is a sacred animal for 85% of the country. Uh, cow milk is also sacred. But people are engaging in these behavioral changes because as diagnostics become more, uh, more available and accessible, you kind of identify lactose allergies and uh, intolerance. And so those are the kinds of things that are health-related. But also, again, getting back to the point is that if you give consumers the choice uh, for various products that are competitive at cost, then you should just let them make the decision because in the long run, that is going to be the most sustainable thing that's going to happen. So again, uh, dairy is an important example. And then uh, people always ask me, like, uh, we haven't seen APs at scale at a national level in any setting, even in Singapore or some small place like that. But I like to counter with a counter example. Like if India was not so culturally averse to beef, Today, our methane emissions would be sky high given India's per capita incomes. So that is just a counter natural experiment that you can see where, you know, uh, so if we can get APs to scale, um, that, that can definitely help. But again, I think APs should be done with sustainable proteins and encouraging enteric fermentation technologies like, you know, uh, your seaweeds and what have you, because uh, you have to bring the entire sector along. And even when EV funding was being given to, by the U.S. government, you had certain attractive incentives to oil and gas, as well as to existing automotive sector to increase their mileage per gallon and things like that. So it has to be a completely comprehensive approach. We can't have beef, no beef, things like that. But it has to be a rational policy approach, um, if you want to go ahead and scale. It's, it's, it's just incredibly important that we scale up for a number of reasons, but I think your point about the fact that India would have a huge methane footprint if it weren't for its cultural and religious ideology, that is something that gives me a lot of pause because we talk about how in America, for instance, we're just so into meat and dairy that we can't, we can't decouple, but I see as people are waking up that changing. And I hope that the that the cause of veganism and the ethics of, of you know a meatless Monday, for instance, can really have an impact because each of those choices, every single day, does matter. We see that in our own lives. Um, I, I want to highlight something that's happening in our ecosystem, and I'm going to ask Lisa a question related to it. Here at COP, we are lucky for the first time to have a waste pavilion. This has been never before. It's a waste and resource pavilion. It's from Iswa, but it is one building over and two floors above us. So there is not just a siloed intellectual element to this at COP, but there is a spatial element to this as well. Lisa, because of the world that you work in and you, you bridge both parts of those worlds, I want to ask you the following question. What have been your takeaways from this COP about hearing from Waste World? What have you heard in the Waste World here that you can s talk about that are relevant for the food systems? Yeah. I think this is such an interesting observation, and I'm really glad you raised it, right? Because I think um, yesterday we were actually here all day with this amazing team in the back, and we were talking about food loss and waste the entire day in this uh, really um, I feel like unfortunate irony that a third of all food produced for human consumption, we're not even talking about animal consumption as well, or biofuels, is it never makes it to people's place. And just how that is causing so many harmful emissions, including methane, um, and what can we do to mitigate it. And I think a lot of what you both have talked about related to the rice challenges, I mean, these are very complex systems and food loss and waste is happening across supply chains. It looks different in, in various countries, the ways that you were to prevent it or to mitigate it. Um, you know, it can be incredibly challenging and very location specific. And so, um, so I think it's a, it's, a real, it's, a, it's a real challenge that we, we have at hand. What I find it interesting is that the waste community, I think, recognized the danger and the harm of food loss and waste long before the food systems community did, in, in my view, right? So food banking's been around for several decades at this point, and they really exist because so much of what is being thrown away is wholesome edible surplus that could be redistributed. Um, you know, but I don't think there was a recognition within the food systems community about the magnitude of this problem or within the methane challenge that you cannot essentially, you know, reach your methane targets if you do not deal with food loss and waste. You have to deal with rice, you have to deal with uh, livestock, and then you have to deal with waste. Um, food loss and waste. And so I think it's exciting that there has been more recognition of this at this COP. We know that the declaration that came out on December 1st, which be, has been endorsed by more than 130 countries at this point, specifically calls out food loss and waste.
embraced as an important target on the food systems climate agenda. There was a non-state actors call to action um, put together by a committee and had 10 actions related to food systems. Food loss and waste reduction was one of them with an emphasis on the circular economy. I feel like the food loss and waste conversation used to be just about prevention, which is incredibly important. You have to prevent first, but we're not going to be able to solve the issue with just a prevention focus. We have to think about how we develop a circular economy approach to it. So I think that um, what we're hoping to see is more solidarity between those two communities in the future. I want to close just with a really quick um, anecdote about, um, about COP last year, and I'm sorry that my mic is being a little bit crazy. Um, but uh, I had the um, privilege of being part of a, a, pav a pavilion that was co-hosted by the Global Methane Hub. And I really got to know um, a couple of the colleagues from Gaia at that point, right? And they are really working on landfills. And I think what's, what was super interesting about talking with them is that they had, again, a higher awareness about the challenge of food loss and waste and then most people in the food system. And what was really troubling is that those people are also incredibly challenged with food insecurity overall. And so I think that, um, that this is a real um, you know, irony in our food system and uh, the time is here to address it. And for those who aren't familiar with Gaia, their platform essentially is to prevent uh, incineration, but what that means in reality is making sure that things don't go to landfill as a first as a first stop. So even a landfill is, is obviously the, the most preventable area, but then they don't also want incineration, which leads back to circularity, frankly, in their eyes. So regenerative agriculture practices is something they focus extensively on and things like that. So I highly encourage everyone here to look at them if they haven't yet and familiarize yourself. Terrific. Chris, uh, as the major corporate in the room uh, and the leadership role that Danone has taken, um, th something that's unique about Danone that was so exciting for me to read is that, um, is that you all announced when, when you committed to a 30% methane reduction in the milk space that it would be specifically in methane instead of CO2 equivalents. Yeah. And for those who aren't familiar with this concept, just in case there are people in the room, if we benchmark CO2 with methane in terms of the global warming potential, we risk having to have a conversation around the time frame of those emissions. And you can undervalue the true impact of the climate emergency by choosing one global warming potential over another. The conventional CO2 equivalent is GWP 100 because mm. CO2 is a long-lived climate pollutant. And so it is very, very noteworthy and exciting that Danone did something special. They announced that their commitment was going to be in methane. And so there will be dual accounting, as I understand, correct? Mm -hmm. Can you please explain to me how you convince people to do this? For one, wait, I've got other questions. Yeah. And also, um, how did this strategic reduction goal benefit Denon? And can it inspire others to do similarly? Wow, tough one. Um, let me let me take it a couple different ways. One, and, and I missed two companies that joined, uh, and I, I want to get them out there because this is big, right? And this was months and months and months of discussions. And by the way, on, to get to your question, really, Kraft Heinz and, and I think Nestle were the two that I missed in the previous piece. Um, I think all those companies have some form of science-based target or net zero commitment, so they're already going down these paths, as are many others, which is great, right? And we're all in different stages of these uh, investments and whatnot, and, but that's all within CO2E, to your point, right? We report through the science-based target initiative, it goes to the CDP, and there may be other indexes as well as data goes to, but it's in a CO2E equivalent, which makes sense, right? These are complicated systems that we're aggregating data on. We have soil, we have N2O, which by the way, we have an N2O pilot in the US going on next year. So these are wide ranging sets of activities and investments where data is tough. The data quality is an issue, right? The, I, I would argue that our data that we're collecting from farms in the U.S. program is probably the best out there, one of the best out there, and I'd put it up against anybody's in terms of quality of data. We have great data coming from Europe. We have our Morocco project we're going to need, but the data sets can vary, right? And so it's hard to do. And by the way, whether it's Danone or any of the other companies, we're not the arbiter of the methodologies. We shouldn't be the arbiter of the methodologies. Get good data first, get as granular as you can from the farms in our case that we're working with. That's challenge one. We hire a firm in the US called Sustainable Environmental Consultants. They're the intermediary, kind of independent party that collects the data on behalf of the farm. 
the farm keeps their data. We don't get it. We just get the output, aggregated output, which is really important from a confidence and trust perspective. So I'm just giving you one example. I mean, this is not easy stuff. And so, but getting that granular data is your first step, right? Once you get that data, and I'm a lawyer, I'm not a data scientist, but I'll, I'll pretend to be one for a second. Once you get that quality data, in theory, you can plug it into any available tool that's out there, you know, through API systems or whatnot. So that's where the publicly available and ver hopefully validated methodologies by others, universities, governments, whatnot, that's what we'll use at the end of the day. So, and there are gaps, right? So this is actually gonna be one of the first steps that we take with Environmental Defense Fund in this new group is which methodology. So get your good data so that you can actually do this. That's, that's, on, that's what the companies will have to do. But we're not gonna just pick the methodology. We've gotta find the methodology. So this is gonna be hard. You know, you mentioned GWP star, or GWP 100, and all that. That's actually, that's important, but there's actually other pieces to that. I'll give you an example on manure. We are spending tens of millions of dollars on manure projects in the United States and Western Europe right now. It's 20 to 35% methane reductions per project. Could be a half a million, could be three quarters of a million dollars for these projects, very cost prohibitive for a farm. <laughs> we use Cool Farm Tool Alliance as one of our methodologies uh, for, for farm quantification. We have gaps on the manure side. We're going to under-report next year, most likely, on terms of the output. We'll remedy that, hopefully, but bottom line is we have to find methodologies. We're going to have to work with universities and others, and I don't have the answer for it, Rhett. So we had to convince these other companies, take this step, get good data, do the work with the farms, and then we'll work on the methodologies as we go. Uh, it, we don't have all the answers for it yet. And, and I would underscore that point as well. We've been trying uh, from the, I'm, I'm a climate change economist, I focus on methane specifically, and as it pertains to business and their green transition. And we have been trying for years with SBTI to say, hey, uh, consider methane. And the fact that you all have made this announcement of this alliance and that you're working with EDF, I believe will bring a conversation to their front door that will say, we must consider this because it is to our own peril that we not be able to meet these commitments. In my ad, it's, you're right, and I do foresee conversations with SBTI on this and probably others as well, um, but there's also another piece, which is greenhouse gas protocol, yeah, right? That's course. our accounting rules, the, which by the way, everybody, I mean, from an international standpoint or even a US standpoint, this is our government. These are our regulations, for better or for worse, and they're not complete and they're evolving and they continue to improve, but we, from a universal accounting and quantification standpoint, if you don't like the data we put out, well, you can blame us and we'll get blamed for sure, but we also have these systems that we have to improve as a collective. It's not on just one company, it's on our collective to improve these systems. This is a conversation I think would be its own breakout session, yeah. and I, th I look forward to these conversations because I think this is really where the rubber meets the road, and the notion that we need to have better methodologies for accounting for things is, this is why I think we see so much money flowing into MRV, and DMRV, and, and all these academics across the country. But can I just say, and, and I've run into these conversations many times, because we all know there's plenty of investors and companies sitting on the sidelines waiting for clarity. You do not have to wait. We know these projects have benefits. They have multiple benefits beyond greenhouse gas in many cases to the farm. You can get started, you can collect the data, and then we can debate and modify the methodologies as we go. It, it, you can do this in a two-step dance of sorts. I agree, and it's really exciting because of the alliance and the dairy industry. I think that this is, this is the, the beginning of the stone moving much, much faster. And this is, for me, the biggest achievement of COP because I don't think the catalytic funding that was, that was announced by the World Bank is going, and others is going to be the thing that moves things forward fast. I think it's this alliance, frankly. So thank you. Thank you. Thalek, yeah. um, can farmers be incentivized to adapt methane reductions? We hear how from farmers in the rice arena that every Tuesday and Wednesday they get somebody knocking on their door telling them, hey, there's a new solution I have for you. If only you do this, I'll save you money. You'll have bigger yields. And by the way, it helps the environment. And they're not from their in-group who are, who are bringing these ideas to the, to the doorstep. So what, what can be done to incentivize farmers? Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, the, you know the most of the other countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, the, the our government are subsidizing fertilizer. And each and every season, they have to depend on this fertilizer. The farmers has to depend on that. And the instead of that, we, the Sri Lanka uh, going as a bad example in the world now, but uh, the, the c transition to the organic in the last years, so what happened was, 
the government has given a one-time grant to the farmers, which they can build up a biogas unit or the something for the, their own, the, the kind of, uh, the, they can't do the, uh, the kind of a big investment, but government has assisted with that kind of uh, the one-time grant. And it helped them to build up the, some of these, uh, the biogas units and all other things. And even the, if you uh, transition to the, the, these uh, f uh, friendly methods, the eco-friendly methods, li just like SRI, you may need some labor into that because the, it is not a normal practice. You have to add your labor uh, into the field. And for that, of course, we need uh, uh, farmers to encouragement to go into this system. And therefore, we have to help them uh, to build in, uh, in their own methods. If you are uh, the, in uh, the first two to three season, if you are taking this risk with the transition, then you will uh, becoming a, the less uh, uh, kind of a labor intensive system. And, and the, 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 the hard part is transition. And for that, we need assistance. And therefore, governments and all other international uh, agencies uh, should look at how we can assist to the small farmers to take this risk for the uh, turning into the transition. And I think it is we have to take in, in a considerable manner. Uh, in these, some of the agreements what uh, we are looking at, and uh, some of the, uh, the bilateral and multilateral uh, the support programs can increase uh, the sum of these supports to farmers to do the transition. I hope it happens quickly because we desperately need the farmers in the rice cultivation area to, to demethanize. I know some people don't like that word, demethanize, but I think it really does still, yeah. it does yeah. still work. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the, I forget to uh, tell uh, uh, the other important thing. The farmers, uh, the, the, uh, the governments are also uh, paling with the uh, providing the new knowledge uh, or the, uh, the, uh, the, the new the extension system. Therefore, the, the, uh, the cost effective system is uh, tra uh, the, uh, changing to the, uh, the digitization and that will uh, give, uh, th that can save a lot of money to the even the, the government uh, to farmers to do the extension through the digital uh, the systems. Thank you. I want to do two things rapidly. Um, I want to ask the panel with one <coughs> sentence each a question, but then also, so I'll, I'll, I'll we'll take a, a question from the audience also, and if we have time, I'll ask you that question. Uh, so, anyone in the audience have a question? Please. Please also st state your name. Thank you. Uh, I'm Thirini from Sri Lanka, and uh, happy to see a Sri Lankan panelist uh, here. Uh, I work for Slag and Trust, and also I work for, uh, I work, uh, for the multi-actor partnership uh, in climate disaster risk management uh, in the context of ensure resilient uh, in Sri Lanka, and also I represent Meatless Monday Sri Lanka. So my question is to Mr. Tilak. Um, so, um, so I uh, today I'm um, like asking you the question, uh, not as a like a professional or anyone, uh, from someone from the farmer background, like a, a, a person from the farm background. So uh, my question to you is. Uh, when you uh, go and talk to these farmer communities and introduce this uh, three uh, method, the strategy, uh, the mechanism, how difficult or uh, easy for you to, the con uh, to convince the idea to the people? Because I know when, uh, when, I, when I am in my background, so how hard it is to like convince the idea, the the strategies, new methods to the uh, to the this farmer community because you know um, when it comes to people in my area, they don't like uh, like they are really re reluctant to change their traditional methods. 
So uh, my question is, did you f uh, like, do you have any success stories yeah. from the field? Thank you. Yeah. Can I? Yeah. Please. Uh, especially when it comes to the, uh, the, uh, the convincing farmers, we use a, a, a method called Palmer to Palmer, uh, the, con uh, the transition, because uh, this help a lot. And we have uh, some demonstrative farmers who are convinced and uh, they can explain it very well with the farmer's language. And, and we have uh, this, uh, all over the country, we have uh, seven different farms uh, based in the, uh, the different uh, agroclimatic <coughs> regions. And they are pioneer farmers who can demonstrate and talk about the, with the farmer day-to-day -day practices. And that given a kind of a success uh, to us because they talk their language and 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 uh, the, they talk about their day-to-day -day income and and the if they don't find the inc uh, the economically valuable options then they will not transit and the success is that uh, the uh, let's say about the example in Bibila, we have a f uh, the government farm, and nearby there is a, the our a farm demonstra uh, leader farmer, and he explained very well, and his farm is receiving lot of farmers than the government uh, farm uh, to get learn uh, from the, the his on experience and this is the success i think we have to demonstrate something to farmers to convince and this was farmer to farmer communication and it's really worked very well and you know you see also in in consumption habits that one of the most powerful ways to get someone to choose a new product is by being referred to it by a peer so same thing in agriculture right we would trust your neighbor who knows what they're talking about yeah um, I, I think this is a really important question because if it's if we're talking here, that's just talk of it on the ground. Just it, it's 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 wasted air. So thank you. Yeah. Um, we have just a few minutes, so I thought I would ask the following. It's a rapid fire question, but it's one that I think can open up conversations. I hope for next year and for the months to come between now and the next COP. What does the private sector need in order to achieve an impactful methane reduction in the food systems? What's missing here? If you can give a one sentence answer and whoever is ready to speak, I know my answer. I wonder what yours would be. <laughs> yeah. Lisa, you wanna go first? We can just go down the line. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think we need very significant investment, um, especially in the food loss and waste area. It's gotta be strategic. Um, I think we need to pick very specific countries and certain segments in the supply chain and be very targeted with how we're gonna be reducing food loss and waste. Um, and I think if we can couple that with policy change in a few key areas, we'll be able to move the needle. I'd say enabling policy environment um, in addition to investments because that's gonna help with rapid adoption once the product is ready, so very short. Yeah, very similar. Uh, strategic investment from all angles of society, not just corporate, government, philanthropic. We see all that. How does it come together? Policy can be a great way to blend that together. We call it public-private partnerships or what have you. That We need to be strategic in how all that comes together. The, to me, it's uh, very important to, as he said, the policy environment, because uh, in the countries like us, where the corruption and all other things are happening, and it is very important we to have a very good policies in the in place and same time good partnership as he said the public private and the the other groups who can be contribute so i think for my first time at cop i have unanimous consensus from a <laughs> from a panel it's a <laughs> I was going to say carrots and sticks which is what they said so uh, regulatory uh, sticks and financial carrots for incentives uh, and, and to cultivate the market space. So I'm, I'm with you, I, I uh, wish us all luck. Thank you for coming and thank you all for being here. And thanks to Olive Farm and to Lee. Thank you. And of, and of course, of course, thank you to the Food Systems Pavilion for hosting us. And, and of course, the Global Cellular Agriculture Alliance. <laughs> <laughs>